Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Christine Saxon. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. I'm one of the instructors in the CCE's um, leadership uh, certificate and advanced leadership certificate. And I am really delighted to talk to you today with this juicy topic of blind spots, bias, and what I like to call their antidote, the power of the pause. So just a little intrigue there. We'll see what we'll see what that looks like as we start. So I invite you right now to get yourself a piece of paper, a pen, you know, have your favorite drink. Have yourself a cat stretch right now. <clears throat> we can't all see each other, so no one will worry if they're stretching and making funny faces. The reason I invite you to do this is I learned this at the beginning of COVID when, when we were predominantly online and all getting used to it. When, you know, if, if you have a cat or a dog, you know, when they're laying there in a sunbeam and they, they wake up and they just do this glorious stretch that looks so wonderful. They don't just do it because it feels so good. What it is, it's from thousands of years ago before we invited them into our warm, cozy homes when they were living in the wild. And what that does, when you stretch like that, it pumps your blood, it gets your blood pumping more to your heart, you breathe, you, you oxygenate your blood, and you actually give your, your brain a shot of awakeness, almost like a shot of caffeine. So anytime you need to wake yourself up, just do that. So get yourselves comfortable, and let's begin. So what I'm going to invite you to do is I will be probably for about 45 minutes of our time together. Um, I'll be sharing a lot with you. I'm going to be asking you to participate, to put your thoughts and ideas into chat. When you have some specific questions, please write them down for yourself. Um, or you can send them in through chat and Emma will, will watch for them. If I see them pop up in the moment, um, I will answer them in the moment. If not, Emma will try to catch them. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll have around 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how long, how long we spend on the content together. Um, and then I can, I can answer them at the end if I haven't answered them as we've gone. All right. So grab a pen. I'm going to be sharing. I don't ever, I'm, I'm a, so I'm an instructor. I'm also an executive coach and a leadership coach. Um, I have a leadership program in uh, Germany called Empower for female academics. A lot of what I do is sharing content, talking about things like blind spots, emotional intelligence, you know, sharing information with you. And always I want people to walk away with something they can put in their pocket and start using right away. That's why I say grab a pen. My goal is that each of you will walk away with at least one aha idea one strategy, one thing that you will start doing or, or a way that you'll start thinking differently or watching for right away. So my goal is each of you will have a takeaway. So um, I don't know why this guy just reminds me of Richard Gere, but here's just a, a picture of, off the internet to show that really our focus today, we're focusing in on this short time together on a huge topic, two of them actually, blind spots and bias. So let's focus in today and give you just enough that you'll take something away and that if you want to, you'll know where you can look for more information on these things. <laughs> Thank you, Yvette. It's not just me. <laughs> okay, so first I want to invite you to send to chat. Who, who here is already aware of some of your blind spots or if, have you looked into unconscious bias? And put a little, put a little, you can just say me in chat, or if you have something that you want to share with us about that. So what's your level of awareness of blind spots and unconscious bias? So just put something into chat. Aha, we've got a couple of people that have. Nice. And if there's anything that you want to share at this time, like here's how it helped me, or here's where I am with my awareness, or here's what I'd like to learn more, I can customize as we go. Yeah, Felicia's point is an interesting one. More blind than I realized, so becoming aware. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're not alone in that. <laughs> Okay, we've got, so as you would expect, because we have, I think, over, over 100 people signed up, we've got about 55 already, um, you're going to be at different stages. Um, 
Ah, Haley, great example. Haley has taken some unconscious bias training pre-pandemic, looking for some refresher. Okay. Yeah, Eva, you know what? I, I, I really value what you put there of, of your reason, right? Made myself aware so I can understand others' perspectives more and not be surprised as much. Okay. Because of course, first it starts with learning about your own blind spots, your own bias. And then of course, by doing that, we learn about others and we become curious about others. Okay, so let's keep going and please feel free to keep commenting on chat. <clears throat> so the work, the work that I and other coaches do around, um, around self, around it, it starts with self, right? Understanding yourself. It's largely about mindsets and behaviors. So the end story, I have a, I have a halls, I, I have long COVID apparently, and I'm coughing still, <clears throat> which is not really ideal as a, as someone who talks for a living. So excuse me if you hear this clacking around. Self development, going, who am I? You know, what's going on for me? How can I bring my best self forward? How can I paddle my boat, paddle my own boat forward? This is a metaphor that I use in my coaching a lot. If you want to really roll it up into what is it that we're looking at with self development? It's our behaviors, how we show up. So think of an iceberg and then under the surface our mindsets and the relationship be between them. And a significant part of all of this is our wonderful brain. And I found this visual and thought this is perfect. You know, we like to feel like we're at the wheel. We like to feel like as we paddle forward, oh yes, we're, we're perfectly in control. We, you know, we've done all this training. We've got all this self-awareness. I've, I've gone so deep in self-awareness for, for so many years. I still pop into reactions naturally. I still go to my default behaviors, even though I've learned not to. I still show up pretty wonky. I still have misbehaviors. I'm just more aware of them and can, can shift course more quickly. This isn't about being perfect, folks. I see myself as perfectly imperfect because of our brains. So any of you that have looked into neuroscience, into neuroplasticity, into shifting habits, using, using rituals, for example, and, and really trying to rewire our, our, our neural pathways, knows that um, this, this path to self-development is never going to end because if you picture a brain and, and maybe put it in segments, 85 to 90% of our daily way that we are, our thinking, our feeling, our reactions, our blind spot, our bias are unconscious. They're automated by our brain. So that means, right, 10 to 15% is where we, we are driving or where we can manage or where we can clean up or go, oops, that happened. What do I do about it now? This can be really hard for some people to hear. In particular, I, I work with people on, on core values a lot and someone who has a core value of control and really wants to be responsible and in charge and feel empowered, hearing that sometimes they go, oh my gosh, 85 to 90% is unconscious. Hmm, what do I do about it? So let's talk about what we can do about it. So this is what I mentioned a moment ago, this, this iceberg model. We all know the, the most common metaphor for icebergs is, you know what, all we can see is the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot more going on underneath. And the tip of the iceberg, if, if we picture, picture you and everyone around you as an iceberg, right? We're all floating around doing our best. All we can see of each other is our behaviors. All we can see to make sense of that person is what, what we see them do and what we hear them say. We can't see this rich, robust, uh, dark, hidden life underneath, the mindsets. So thoughts, feelings, values, beliefs, and biases and blind spots. Awareness of that relationship, right? That it actually goes back and forth. Our mindsets influence our behaviors for sure. You know, you have a belief about something, you're going to behave a certain way. You have a bias about something deeper down where it's darker there. You may not have uncovered it yet, but if you have a bias about something, of course, it's going to, to uh, manifest as a behavior or, or influence your behaviors. And interestingly, I don't have the arrow on there, but the arrow goes the other way. Sometimes when we behave a certain way, it influences our mindsets. 
So if we, let's say you choose to be really vulnerable all of a sudden, you're like, I'm going to try this vulnerable thing that Brené Brown talks about and be really vulnerable. And ouch, doesn't go so well. You might get a different guarded mindset then as a result of that. So there's this interplay. So this awareness of the relationship between behaviors and mindsets, behaviors and mindsets really can help people bring their best self forward. And I don't mean be the best. I mean, your own best self. It's about your how. I coach people in all different industries. I am an instructor for people from all different, all different walks of life, all different levels in their career. And um, always it's, it's, it's just your best self. It's your how. I don't help people with their what. I, I can coach engineers. I can coach teachers. I can coach farmers. But it's, I, I'm not going to coach them in their field of expertise. It's your how. That's why I call it paddling your boat. I, I help people with, with your how. Oh, Yvette's got a question. Life experiences directly affect biases? Interestingly, they, they do. Um, it, it would be a, an unconscious, um, it would be a more nurture than nature for, for some, depending who you read about this, they say it's more about life experiences that create a bias. Part of it is just natural and it comes from survival, something like in-group bias is that natural affinity towards, oh, we're in the same group together, let's create a tribe. Because of our, you know, thousands of years of history of needing to be in a group to be safe. Then layer on to Yvette's point, then layer on things that we notice, our life experiences. Yes, they absolutely affect biases. They might turn the volume up on them or they might create a new one. Good question. Okay. So let's start then with blind spots. Blind spots being, um, the first time I learned about blind spots, about communication blind spots, it was explained this way. Blind spots are things others can see about you, but you can't see. And then later I learned to use the word yet, because we can watch for other people's behaviors. We can become aware of blind spots and in doing so, unearth some of them ourselves too. But there are things that others can see about us that we can't see or that we haven't discovered yet. So good old Patrick here. I don't know. Some of you might find this as amusing as I did. I love this. I can't see my forehead. Right? Great kind of literal example of a blind spot. It's something you can't see about yourself. And if any of you have done, um, I, was, I worked for Farm Credit Canada for 12 years. And at one point in time, I was one of the corporate videographers and we would go out and interview, um, we would interview food processors and farmers and experts in the field. And then it got to the point where we were interviewing and it was two cameras and we were interviewing ourselves as we interviewed them. And I learned that I move my hands a lot as you might've noticed. And until we actually see ourselves candidly, naturally, we don't necessarily know this unless we have someone helpful that lets us know. So my story of this is, first of all, the, the interview process for me was fascinating. I invite you to think for yourself, do you ever have an opportunity to watch yourself, to hear yourself, whether it's through, maybe if you do podcasts or, or hear your voice sometimes, or actually see yourself. Uh, the, the corporate example that I have, the professional example I have is I was, I was interviewing, um, Jean-Philippe Gervais, who's the chief uh, ag economist, who at the time was chief ag economist. And uh, he was talking to me about weather patterns and economics and concerns that he had about this. And so two cameras on both of us just did the interview. I went back to edit it. And Jean-Philippe was saying, yes, Christine, I'm concerned about, you know, the intersection of what's going to happen with interest rates and weather. And then me asking the question, I was going, oh, oh. Oh, and my face just was emoting so much more extreme than what he was talking about. I didn't realize that I emoted sometimes and I showed through my face more strongly than what I needed to. So we actually re-videoed me asking him the questions um, because it was too much. It was out of sync. That awareness for me raised awareness for me about a blind spot, an actual physical one, right? A behavior one, not one underneath, underneath the surface. And I'm sharing these examples to help you think about ways that you could find out about your blind spots. 
again, with the physical thing with my hands, my lovely daughter, when she was in middle school, I asked if she, we lived at Regina Beach and I asked her if she wanted to go to the beach that day. And she went, she's always called me Christine, not mom, when, since she was about 10. And she went, sure, Christine, that'd be great. We can drive, you can bring a ball and we can play fun. I said, thank you for reminding me that I wave my hands around a lot and it's helpful. So it, you know, cute, funny, relatable ones about behavior, think about the ones underneath. That's what we're gonna look at, it's those ones underneath. So I'm super grateful, even if it was awkward, seeing myself on video that time, getting that feedback from my daughter. But think about this, this is why I shared those stories. What blind spots, thinking about it, through people's behaviors, either directly or indirectly, you know, for example, I, I learned years ago that I, because I'm so interested in what the other person is saying, I interrupt. I didn't realize it from over here until I would have people talk like this as I was talking to carry on their point, or they would go, go ahead. So I know they didn't say, oh, Christina, I want to point out a blind spot, but I noticed in their behavior. So what blind spots have other people pointed out to you or just by you noticing that feedback? What blind spots do you know of that you have? And I invite people to share them in chat. Things that you might not have seen or known about yourself. Ah, <laughs> Kirsten, I'm not alone, the interrupting one, yeah. Oh, Pam is the same, yeah. <laughs> Ah, strong voice, yes. Yeah, the interrupter blind spot, interesting. Oh, look at Danica, right? So um, what in, in, I don't play poker, but I think that's called your tell. If you have a hard time keeping a neutral face when you disagree, right, you're, you're easy to read. Oh, these are great. <laughs> Joyce, you're aware of yours. <laughs> Okay, so, so here's, a, here's your first takeaway. Watch for, now that you think about, hmm, what, you know, if I wanna uncover some more blind spots, watch for what you're noticing in people's reaction to you. And watch in a self-compassionate and a curious light way, the way that I'm sharing these and the way that people are sharing. Ah, Daniel, yours is going underneath, underneath the surface, right? More around mindsets and how they might show up as behaviors. Thank you for sharing that one. And as we move forward, I'm going to give you some examples and you can see if any of the, the names that we call these blind spots resonate for any of you. Okay, great share, folks. Thank you. You're going to, I have a, as an instructor, I really, I have a firm belief and it is, I'll tell you, every time it's demonstrated, you will learn as much from each other as you will from me. So the more you can share like this, the more that you'll see, oh, I'm not alone or, oh, yes, me too. I hadn't thought about that. Okay, there's some more on there. So I'll give you a moment to read through these. Interesting. Yeah, your tone changes. We have our tells. Yeah, these are great. Okay, so let's keep going. So we're going to go through 10 blind spots. Some of you may have seen these before. Um, some, some may not. <clears throat> Watch for ones that you suspect might be at play for you. They might be activated for you. Um, and then I'll invite you to share on chat. I'll pull the list up again and you can type in which ones. So it'll be interesting for you to see how many other people identify the same ones you did or whether you are a, an outlier in this group. Okay, so I'll invite you after we go through the 10 to uh, share. So you can see them all here, but we're gonna go through one, one at a time. I'm just gonna do a time check. <clears throat> First one, going it alone, being afraid to ask for help. Actually, let's do them one at a time. So going alone might look like this. Mm. Oh, George, I know we're working on the project together. I just, I knew you were busy, so I did your part too. And taking it all on. And what might, what might have shown up for you is going, oh, George isn't going to get it done in time. <sighs> I'll have to do it myself then. I wish people were as dedicated as me and doing it. Or going it alone 
because of wanting maybe to look independent or, or be independent or uh, on here it says being afraid to ask for help or just hesitating to ask for help, not wanting the light shone on you until it's baked. If you're someone who is like, I, I don't want people to see this till it's fully bite, baked, going it alone might show up as a blind spot. So in chat, anyone thinking this might be one for you? To being in, ice, in isolation? Um, it's more about not reaching out for others, Omer, um, and doing things independently. So let's say you're at, you've, at the final stage of your project and it would really benefit if someone else read through it, but not doing it, not asking someone. There, you, if you read people's comments here, this might make it clear. These are, these are real signs of it going alone because you don't want to disturb anyone. Okay. <clears throat> so you're not alone. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Next one, being insensitive or unaware of how your behavior impacts others. And this sometimes shows up for people who say, I'm not someone with radar. I don't read the room. I'm not highly empathetic. I don't notice these things necessarily. Or uh, I'm sharing from my, from my experience as a coach, or it shows up for some of my, my coaching clients who um, really like to get her done and are like, let's get this done, let's go. I will share, I was given feedback once when I was at Farm Credit Canada, actually. I had been in human resources as a business partner to the leaders, a trusted partner. Then I shifted over to be more of a project leader, a project manager. And I had one of those same leaders come up to me and say, Christine, I'm just experiencing you differently. When you were my HR business partner, I was like, you were there and you took time and you really focused on my needs. Now it's kind of like, get out of the way because bodies are gonna fly. So it was hard and important feedback for me, but I was unaware or insensitive about my behavior. So any, anyone want to share on this one? Oh yeah, there's some people already. Yeah. I think Christy and Yvette, you were responding to number two. Okay. First one was yours, okay. And Pam's got a question. Oh yes, there's a danger in, in, in well, there's a, is there a danger in being too sensitive? Um, in relation to number 10. Mm. Yeah, I was once coached and was uh, given this statement to become more aware about times that I was overly vigilant about other people's moods. I am very sensitive. And anyone here aware of HSP, highly sensitive person? HSP is a categorization that, that defines some of us who are sensitive to light, sensitive to sound, and we can feel the feeling in the room. We are like carrying the elephant in the room. Um, uh, sometimes are told that we're too sensitive. So yeah, there, there is certainly, um, there's benefits, Pam, I'll say, in my opinion, there's real benefits of being that sensitive. And I help people put a volume button on it. Sometimes that sensitivity can help. Sometimes it can be overwhelming. Okay. Oh, some great examples in here. Yeah, lots of empathy. Empathy, just, just folks, if you ever think of a strength or feedback you've gotten like empathy, just put the prefix over or under it in front of it. Sometimes we over empathy, right? We like overly empathize, sometimes under empathy. So a volume button metaphor helps people. Yvette, I love that you say this because I have an antidote for you that I learned recently. For people who say sorry, that's the behavior. Underneath the surface, there's lots going on. Say thank you instead. So sorry I'm late, replace with thank you for waiting for me. What it does is rather than shining the light of, oh my God, I feel embarrassed or shameful, I'm so sorry, and focusing on us, you focus on the other person and thank them. Sorry that my tone of voice hurt you. Thank you for telling me about that. There you go, there's a takeaway already for some people. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, third one, having an I know attitude valuing being right that need to be right this is and folks i love your openness with this because this is shining light on oh yeah i do that sometimes too 
right? So that's why I'm sharing. I do. Um, I, I again in a, in a work environment, um, I had a tendency to go like this. I would say, "Really?" And it looked like I was going, "Really? I know better." And we came up with a joking way as a team. They were going to get me a, a jar, and I had to put a loony in each time. I went, "Really?" And I explained to them what that what that came from was. I was curious, and it meant I wanted to dig more. But it looked like I was a know-it-all, like, really? You would think that way, really? And it was a blind spot for me. Yeah, Christina saying, otherwise known as being a know-it-all. And I put my hand up a lot. I was keen, I was like, oh, I know about that. Oh yeah, let's do that. And my excitement showed up as know-it-all attitude. And then when I was really honest with myself, I wanted to be important. That's what was deeply underneath. Yeah, Omer, and I know attitude sometimes refers to being overconfident, and it can lead to mistakes and errors. Good point, Omer. If you think of a combination of an I know attitude and going it alone, so being on your own island and thinking you're right, you've lost that opportunity to, to uh, ask others, you know, what have I missed? Poke some holes in this. How can we do this better? Our, our ways, those are antidotes. Great. Fourth one, avoiding the difficult conversation conflict avoidance. First of all, I would love to you to just say, just put yes or me or something if this shows up for you. If number four shows up for you, I'd love to see how many people. So one, two, three, four, five, six. See, you're not alone. Seven, eight, nine, 10. Number four is your number one, 11, 12, 13. Wow. Yeah. This is super common. I teach, I coach leaders often. I have dozens of coaching, maybe a hundred coaching clients right now. And this is so common. Look at all of you. Yvette's like, yes, with three exclamation marks. So conflict avoidance. Thank you, Brain, for wanting me to avoid this conversation. And I've got some tools. This is a strategy I use with people. Thanks, unconscious brain, for trying to protect me because conflict feels scary. And I've got some tools. What that means is you need to have some tools. So think of that 85 to 15% or 90 to 10% brain. Your unconscious brain is often at the root of this ick. Oh no, conflicts haven't gone well before. Haley, good point. It may be that conflict avoidance is culturally ingrained. Yeah. And so if you if you take that, the nurture part of it and the nature part of it, it our brain is like, no, 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 don't, don't have that conversation again. Last time they raised their voice, you felt badly. We're going to make you afraid of it. We're going to give you some anxiety about it. So very common. If you have a core value for harmony, you likely will not jump happily into and naturally into having difficult or important conversations. Okay, next one. Blaming others or the circum or circumstances, which can show up as playing the victim or refusing responsibility. Um, when my kids were in middle school, they and I came back. I was at I was working at Farm Credit at the time, um, and I came home sometimes talking about our culture of accountability. And they would say, "Oh yeah, Mom, we know that our teach one of our teachers taught us when you have one finger pointing out, three are pointing back at you. So take some time to look at what your role is in it." And I was like, "Bravo to the teachers for teaching them that." <coughs> Excuse me. So blaming others or circumstances. I'm going to raise my hand. I do this sometimes. It's, it's quite normal. Again, it's unconscious brain when we feel embarrassed, when we feel um, afraid of making mistakes. We can sometimes go, yeah, yeah, but it was them. Well, I did my best. It must have been that other person. If you think of silos at work, another team against another team, well, that's their responsibility, not ours. That, that's starting to partake in blaming and certainly not in being accountable or responsible. You may not know if it looks like you show up as blaming others. So you could ask and or you could watch your language, watch your, you know, if, if I'm talking, if I'm, if I'm partaking in water cooler talk, talking about that team over there, wait, am I also talking about what our team could do? Or should we pick up the phone? Some of the, some of these I'm not going to ask you to comment on. You, you can if you want. And some of them are kind of tender. Um, treating commitments casually. This is an interesting one that when some people read it and go, oh my gosh, I did this, I do this. Haley, I'm looking at yours using I feel statements instead of you did. Yeah, that, that great antidote. So great suggestion there from, from Haley. Instead of you did, 
saying I feel, or here's the impact I'm feeling about this. Yeah, love it. Treating commitments casually. I wonder if you have shown up late and didn't know it affected someone. I wonder if you've justified when you were late on getting something to someone or when you didn't uh, honor your commitment. Yeah, Felicia, thank you, blah, yes. This is a hard one. This, this sometimes is one of the most eye-opening ones. Are you treating your commitments casually? And sometimes an antidote is as simple as saying, I am not where I committed to being on this project. Let's talk about it. And just, just acknowledging it, naming it, saying, I recognize you've put more into this than I have so far. And you can say, I'm sorry. Or you can say, thank you. Uh, Christina, yeah, procrastination can really have that effect. Yeah. Oh, and Haley, you've noticed this with others. Yeah. And now you could point it out to them as a blind spot. You can you could pull this up and say, hey, this actually is a blind spot. Because we don't realize the impact on others necessarily. Right. Seventh one, conspiring against others driven by a personal agenda. That's what I mean about some of these. Some of these are pretty tender. I see that earlier in my career, there were times when I got pulled into groups talking about leaders, us versus them. Uh, when I was in a unionized environment at a different university, um, that really went on. And it turned sometimes into conspiring against others. Hey, let's all write a letter, things like that. So early in my career, I was, I was, some of that was going on around me and I felt the pull of it and I felt so uncomfortable. So again, if you have any comments for yourself on that one, or if you just want to sit with that one and go, do I do that sometimes? Next one, withholding emotional commitment. Okay, we've got a couple of comments. Let's see. Kim's saying, how could you broach that with someone with them being too casual? Oh, treating commitments casually? Yeah, good question. Um, I will say, I would start with a poll conversation. I'm going to share all of, with you all right now a, a strategy for when you want to have a conversation or, or shine some light on someone. I've noticed this, and I'm wondering this. So Kim, I've noticed, um, I've noticed we are not on the same page when it comes to commitments or dates or timing. And I'm wondering your thoughts on it. I'm wondering what it means to you. I'm wondering if you've noticed. And invite them to share, and then you can, you might have already had something you want to say to them. This is called a pull conversation. You pull first, and then you adjust because you go, oh, they're already aware of it, and they feel bad. They are, oh, they had no idea. But you get more data for yourself, so then you can approach the conversation. So it's just, if, if you want to write down for yourself, I've noticed, and then put a, a line, fill in the blanks. And I'm wondering, fill in the blanks. This helps, yeah, to your point, you don't want them to become defensive. It can help with it. And if someone comes becomes defensive, that's not yours. It's theirs. What you could suggest then is, you know what? I'm noticing that um, you're feeling that you need to justify this, that you may feel uncomfortable about this. How about if we both just take a pause and come back and talk about it tomorrow? Because I want to work towards a positive solution with you. The power of the pause, because defensive often comes from our amygdala, which gets hijacked. Okay, great. Next one. Yeah, so withholding emotional commitment, and they call it emotional blackmail. Um, sometimes it's the silent treatment. That's how it shows up. And underneath, there's probably something really profound going on for us when we're like, no, I'm not. I'm going to be guarded right now with this person. Um, recognizing for yourself when that's happening is important because this one can really derail trust in a relationship. Like if you feel hurt and the other person feels hurt and you're not going to play anymore, you're not going to talk, you're not going to be open. Um, it's just, it's like we both put our stake in the ground. Um, that would be sometimes, first of all, it's recognizing, oh, this is a blind spot. I do this. Um, and then go, what do I need to do about it? And it might, again, be put space between stimulus and response. Say to the person, I'm not emotionally in a good place to talk to you about this right now. I need some time. Or can we come back next week when I've had time to think through it and, and manage my feelings through it? Next one, not taking a stand, lack of commitment to a position. Those of us who are pragmatists and curious and maybe need more time to think things through, 
to us, that's what's under the surface and we value that, it might look like get off the fence, take a stand, have a commitment, have, a, have your position. Is this one resonating for any of you? It sometimes shows up for my clients who are, oh, sometimes it's because you're not interested. Ah, done, yeah. So I guess you could say that if you're comfortable saying that. It might be you don't, yeah, you don't have as much skin in the game, as much interest as others. You may be introverted and, and a processor and need to think through what you want to say, and it looks like you're not taking a stand. It might be that you are curiously minded and don't need to take a stand, and others are looking for you to. Okay, next one, tolerating good enough or low standards for performance. Oh, Christina's got one. I'll sometimes go with the flow and not take a stand on something when I should. Yeah. So now that we're naming it as a blind spot, Christina, you can think about how might that be affecting others around you? And what could you say or do when you notice that's going on? Uh, you bet yours would be the, the opposite, having high expectations. And sometimes it really is good enough, yeah. You can talk to people about agile then, say maybe we've actually met 80% and 80% is enough. So number 10 is tolerating good enough, maybe around performance of people if you're a leader or performance in terms of quality of, of the project and the outcomes. Oh, interesting, Nick. Yeah, seeing being able to see the positives on both side, sides. That's an interesting one because some of us aren't looking for, for a side. And there's a thing, there's a, there's a cognitive distortion that our brains do, similar to an unconscious bias, but it's called the cognitive distortion. It's called either or thinking. It's either I win or you win. It's either um, my team or your team. It's either I'm right and you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong. And we have had, uh, we ha we've actually had a pandemic of it during the pandemic because our brains are trying to protect us. So Nick, your point, seeing the positives of, of both sides of a stand sometimes can help to people to see the gray and the different options in between those two sides. Oh, this is so interesting. This is great. I'm, I'm really enjoying reading. I'm seeing what you're getting out of this and how much it's making you think. And by sharing it this way, others can also benefit from it. So. Okay, we already talked about which ones are at play for you sometimes, so we won't do that. Super important. These are the ones that if you Google the, ten, the top 10 leadership blind spots, I think it's been about six years now that this list has been around. It was published and it just has been republished and republished um, for leaders that these are blind spots. And we all are leaders of ourselves. We're leaders of teams. We're leaders of projects. So these can have pretty big impacts often unintentional. Well, usually unintentional because they're blind spots. If we're not aware of them and we don't know to watch for the impacts, they can even sometimes derail our career progress. If you find yourself going, why do I keep applying for the next level job and not getting an interview or not getting the job? Or what am I not seeing about myself that people aren't telling me? There's an opportunity to have a really frank conversation with some people where you work and say, I, you know, I'm learning about blind spots. I'd like your feedback. You can take this list and say, is there anything on this list that resonates for you? Things that I'm not aware of about myself. So asking for the gift of feedback, it can be uncomfortable and it is the biggest antidote because underneath the surface there, we can't see under there. We can watch other people and watch for feedback and watch for patterns of behavior and how people respond to us. Now that you know these names for them, you can watch for them yourself. If you feel like you are you know, clicking on one of these or having a reaction automatically that's making you go it alone or withhold commitment or whatever it is. And the best way that you can confirm is the gift of feedback. <clears throat> oh, Yvette, how do you pick a safe list of people to take feedback from? Mm, good question. Uh, it's probably different for each person. Um, I think in a way, I think you, you answered it. Make sure it's your safe people. Look at what would the risk be? Um, does this person understand what blind spots are? Um, I would say you could preface it by saying, I am in a phase of self-development and I've learned about these things called blind spots. I'm curious to know if you've noticed any of these things in me so that I can keep growing. 
So it's not inviting people to um, go against you, to see you in a limiting way. I think what you might find with taking that approach is other people go, oh, cool. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And some won't. There's a thing, there's a, there's a, if you look up fixed growth, if you look up mindsets, there are four types of mindsets, open and closed, fixed and growth. Yvette, if you're choosing people who have an open mindset and a growth mindset, it is likely it will be more safe than someone with a fixed mindset or a closed mindset. Okay, I'm going to put this in here. Mindset so that you can all look it up. Open and closed, fixed and growth. And sometimes we go in between them even in a given day, but some people are more closed or fixed in their mindset. And that might not feel as safe. It also might give you some really good, uh, helpful feedback if, you're, if your skin is feeling, yeah, Carol Dweck's book on that, perfect. It's called, ah, I have like two, thank you for mentioning that. Where's Carol? I've got it here. I think it's just called Mindsets. No, I'm not seeing it. I think it must be out at my, at my reading chair. Okay. She, she really was the, the, founding, the founding mother, there you go, of, of the mindset conversations. Here are some possibly, I just put possibly less harmful ones. They're not on this list. So I invite you to put into chat if you notice any of these for yourself. Rescuing. So you see something going on between two people and you jump in and triangulate it and rescue the person because it feels like they are being um, attacked or, or not uh, able to stand up for themselves. Interrupting others, we already saw. Not speaking up or using your voice. Talking about rather than talking to people. Avoiding conflict, we already said. Settling for less than you'd like or perfectionism. Did any of those resound for you? Yeah. And naming them like this is so important because you can take them and put them in your pocket and remember them quickly. Rather than going, oh, I feel kind of weird. What is this? Or I'm feeling off. Oh, it's this blind spot. Okay, of course, I, you know, self-compassion. Of course, this is going on for me. Thanks, brain. I'm going to do this instead. Pam, good question on how gender, race, and other intersectionalities might skew the list. Yes. I don't know if it would be this list, but absolutely there, there is... Uh, difference based on um, probably more than those categories too, that looks at um, which ones would show up more often. I'm not able to right now to, to refer you to any research necessarily on it, but I've read about it in some of the books that, that I'm digging into right now, actually. Yeah, look how many of these are resonant for you. Kristen, thank you for, for framing it that way. Almost all of those are what I naturally do, but do know that about myself, so I'm consciously working on them. <laughs> Folks, just write that down. That's, that's how to manage this stuff. It's not that something's wrong with you. You're not broken. This is, thanks brain, for naturally automatically doing that to make us safe, but I actually have tools for it, or I'm actually aware of it. There you go, Nick. Awareness is 75% of the battle. Yeah, nice. Okay, so here are a couple of antidotes for blind spots. Just looking at the time. Um, I need to move the chat out of the way so I can see them. Here we go. Uh, first one, I call this one the puppy dog look. You know when your dog looks at you like, what are you doing, human? And they do this kind of like that little pup. Watch for people's reaction to you. If you notice people going, what the heck is that about? There might be a wonky behavior an unintended behavior that you're blind to. You might not realize that you're going, mm, or, mm, or, or holding your, you know, clenching your jaw, or your words might be different. So watch for people's reaction and then watch for it happening multiple times. And it might not just be a one-off. Watch others with curiosity and openness. And you may notice their blind spots and, and your brain will then go, oh, that might be a blind spot for that person, rather than your, and we're going to talk about negativity bias, rather than your brain going, aha, that's a flaw for that person. It's a flaw for them, but it's a blind spot for me, is what our brain does. So just by watching with curiosity and openness and go, oh, look how that person's showing up today. Look, they might have a blind spot. I wonder what it might be. 
It's not inviting your brain to go, error, problem, that person made a mistake, which our negativity bias pulls us to do. Uh, ask for others' feedback. We talked about that, and I call it eliminate the blank page. If you just go, hi, I want some blind spot feedback, they might go, well, you don't drive well, and you, you know, you're talking about your blind spot in your car. What are you talking about? <clears throat> Kirsten, it's an actual bias, that thing, judging others for the same thing that you forgive yourself for. So eliminate the blank page. Like I mentioned before, hey, I took this webinar on blind spots. I got this list of 10. Can we look at this and tell me if you've noticed any of these or others? That's a good strategy for uncovering them. You might want to do a 360 assessment, like really dig in if you want to do development. A 360 assessment is done formally and you get feedback 360 degrees around you, you know, from your VP, your director, then from your peers, maybe from people that report to you, and you can compare your results, how you rank yourself to others. Enlist a blind spot buddy to watch for possible blind spots. Say, hey, I think this might be a play for me. Can you watch and let me know? Like my daughter is for me still. Okay, oops, so there's the list of a few of them. This is to uncover them. Here's an antidote to help with them when you notice them. It's to name it to tame it. And this helps your unconscious brain. Notice and label a blind spot or even an unhelpful thought or feeling or realize, realization that you have. I use name it to tame it a lot in my coaching and go, oh, I'm noticing this and name it. Oh, I'm noticing I'm going, I'm starting to conspire against that person. Oh, I notice I'm rescuing. Thanks brain, but I don't need to rescue. Your brain naturally starts to do what I call turn down the volume. They're like, oh, she noticed, good. And it helps to, it, it, I say that it turns off its emergency response system, like red alert, red alert, is what sometimes happens in our reactions. It turns it down and starts automatically to tame it. And I say to do it in a compassionate way. And I go like this, rather than a shameful, oh no, I'm doing that thing again. But instead to say, oh yeah, that blind spot's popping up, right. Okay, what do I wanna do instead? So that's one, name it to tame it. And the next one I just showed you is self-compassion. When you realize you're acting out of a blind spot, it's common and normal to feel badly, like, oh no, and even shameful. Kristen Neff, I'll put her, some of you might be know Dr. Kristen Neff. She studies and writes and speaks on replacing self-judgment and, um, and self What's it called when you think you're like the F-bomb best? There's all these books, self-esteem. She looked at the self-esteem movement and said, we need to replace it with self-compassion. So using self-compassion rather than shame or blame, you won't go down into the valley and feel badly and have like another blind spot pop up, but instead you can be curious and go, I wonder why. Hmm. Okay, we're getting deep here. So we're close to the end already. So I'm gonna take a look at bias. Um, I, I was not expecting the amazing comments and commentary that you have. So let's go through and now we'll shine some light on bias. So um, think about this. I'm not going to get you to put this into chat, but think about what it is and why it matters for you. And now let's go forward. So we're all familiar with conscious biases, but we don't talk about them very often. When I said bias, we're thinking of those unconscious ones, but I just want to point out, we also have conscious ones, right? A preference, a dislike, a prejudice, a strong opinion, a I'm right. And your core values often are what feed those biases. Like how I prefer people who are accepting over those who are judgmental or criticize others. I have a bias towards people who are accepting. Okay, so bias isn't just the unconscious stuff. Sometimes we know what our biases are, but we think they're right and we're okay with it. Some of it is un ingrained and it comes, oh, and sorry, I don't have that nature nurture slide. I took it out. Um, it comes from underlying unconscious bias. So we're gonna look at five, negativity, conformity, confirmation, affinity, and hindsight. First one, number one, most predominant cognitive bias in humans is negativity bias. Those of you who have positivity as a core value and optimism right now are going, ooh, and maybe all of us are, and what it is, it's, it's our brain trying to protect ourselves, trying to protect us. So when you feel that negativity bias come in and it's going, uh-oh, look out, there's bad stuff. Oh, you know, I'm doom scrolling. I'm, 
feeding it through things like doom scrolling is actually really dangerous because you're feeding it a lot and it's already the hungriest of our biases. This is proven that the, the strongest bias for humans because it protects us is negativity bias. Second one, conformity bias, which is otherwise known as groupthink. Um, conformity bias actually comes from our deep-seated need to belong. So how it shows up, think about this for yourself, is if you have some opinions actually, but you've noticed that most people are actually wanting this instead and you just go, okay, and you fold or you don't speak up. So right now, put into chat if you want to, how many of you are noticing negativity bias or conformity bias in yourselves at times? And as I go, you can just keep commenting on these. Next one is confirmation bias. I love this little, ever since you told me about confirmation bias, I'm seeing it everywhere. You're confirming confirmation bias. That's exactly how confirmation bias works. When I lived in Saskatchewan, I live on Vancouver Island now. <clears throat> when I lived in Saskatchewan, I was thinking of getting a truck and I was thinking maybe I want a white truck. Oh my gosh, I saw white trucks everywhere then and decided I don't want a white truck. There's so many white trucks. I had never noticed it before. And there really are more, I think but it might just be confirmation bias. How this shows up, well, it helped me build a case to not buy a white truck. What it does is if, let's see, let's say there's someone that works close to you in your workspace and they come in about 10 minutes late. Aha, they're late again. Aha, they're late again. Aha, they're late again. And then it goes like this and we get blinders on going, oh, they're late on projects. Oh, they're not as dedicated. Oh, they don't speak up. And we start building for more evidence to confirm whatever that case is, whatever that story is that we're creating about them. It's a real strong one. Affinity bias. We prefer people who are like us. In the workplace, one of the ways this really shows up is if you have a cho choice to recruit people onto a committee that you're leading, shows up there. It shows up in, in recruiting and hiring folks in a really big way. Affinity bias does. So there's some practices in HR um, with um, blind interviews or different ways that we can try to counteract affinity bias because we just naturally prefer people who are like us. It's part of that in-group bias that keeps us safe. And the last one, hindsight bias. I just had to share this one. Uh, he probably shouldn't have tried this. We know that now looking back. So thinking we should have seen things coming. What I say to clients when they start going, oh, I should have known, I should have known, is I've learned to say, when you made that decision, did you make it with the best information you had at that time? And 100% of the time people go, well, yeah. Did you feel it was the right decision? Yeah. So hindsight is just helping you look back now that you've found out more data. Hindsight's big, big for you, Don. Yeah, yeah, some people saying negativity and confirmation. So I share these with you. But what I really want to, um, actually, let's do this first. <clears throat> Hindsight for you as well. So just think, I'm, I'm not going to have you share right now. Think about of those five, just with your fingers right now, go for yourself. Which of these do you notice in others around you? Stop shooting on yourself. Yes. <laughs> So I think for yourself, so I'm going to say five. I notice them all for myself. Now, I mean for others. Now, which do you notice in yourself? And often it's fewer. This is the fingers out, pointing the fingers out, fingers in thing that my kids taught me. And here's the interesting thing. There's a bias called bias blind spot. It's a cognitive bias where we recognize the impact of biases on other people's judgment, but we don't think it impacts our own judgment. How's that one for you? We see them in other people. Yeah, lots of you are, are, these are, these are common ones. Always had a bias against groupthink, right? Yeah. These are, they're complex and they can be fun to, to, to explore. So here's some antidotes. And then I'm gonna show you this place where you can learn a lot more about biases. One strategy to keep your biases at bay is the one we said before, name it to tame it. To say, oh yeah, thanks brain for popping up that bias. Thanks brain for the negativity bias. 
Thanks, Brain, for the confirmation bias, but I'm going to take the blinders off and look for other evidence. I'm actually going to look for evidence that goes against my case, right? But by naming it, just saying, oh, yeah, I'm having conformity bias. Just naming it, it starts opening up more. By naming, oh, I'm having negativity bias, aren't I? You start looking for positive as well. Our brain, it's amazing. I, I really coach people to work with this wonderful control center called our brain. Okay, here's the thing I want to share with you. It's called the Cognitive Bias Codex. I have a link for it, but I, I grabbed it and I can't get it to work in chat. If you search for the Wikipedia version, I think it is, of the Cognitive Bias Codex, this is just a piece of it. It's this big round visual. And each of these biases listed in the middle, you can click on and read about it. Click on another one and read about it. I spent hours on this. It's fascinating. Make sure you get one that is clickable because sometimes you'll just get a picture of it. But if you're curious, check out the Cognitive Bias Codex for hundreds of different biases. Yeah, I can't put this link in. It's wikimedia.org. So if you search for the Cognitive Bias Codex. Oh, thank you, Jim. Yay. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Jim just put it in chat. I really appreciate that. It's really cool and fun and neat to share with your team, for example. So now the reason I recognize where we are with time, folks, I'm glad that we can field the questions as we go because I didn't leave us 15 minutes because we're having a lot of fun here. So a very helpful antidote. The reason I called this um, blind spots and bias, the power of the pause is this. Here's my kayak pulled up on Comox Lake. We need to pause. We need to pause in life. We need to pause in the moment. A lot of you probably know Viktor Frankl's um, commonly, commonly cited quote, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. We don't just have to do the automated response thing, right? The 85 to 90% of our brain. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So the power of the pause, right? System number one, our first reaction is 95%. It's fast, automatic, impulsive, little or no effort, emotional. This is where bias lives and pops up. This is where blind spots show up. System two in our brain is the thinking, and it's only 5%, the slower, deliberate, reflective, effortful, and analytical. So hit pause when you notice something. I've noticed, and I'm wondering what would happen if I took a pause. I'm wondering what would happen if I give my brain time to turn off the red alert. So I say, notice it, name it when you're taking the pause, and then you'll be able to navigate it more, more powerfully. That's the power of the pause when it comes to these automated reactions. And so notice your blind spot or bias, name it, and then you'll be able to navigate it. If you want more on this, I have a YouTube channel um, where I go out in my kayak and I do little things like five minutes of what I just talked about. I give little strategies and stuff. And one is called Paddle Your Own Boat, The Power of the Pause. So you're very welcome to check that out if you want. Uh, if you search for YouTube, Paddle Your Own Boat, Christine Saxon, you'll likely find them. So there, there you go. So you're welcome to follow on there. And if you want more on this, we offer the Advanced Leadership Certificate. Once you've finished one of, the, one of the full certificates through CCE, you can take this Advanced Leadership cohort-based deep dive where we have four of us in instru as instructors and you go through cohort-based and you take an emotional intelligence assessment. If this kind of stuff really, really gets you going, ooh, I want more, you might wanna check out the Advanced Leadership Certificate. And if so, I will see you there. <laughs>